I'll be the first to admit that I have some pretty strange beliefs about the world. I think that consciousness exists outside of the body, that sickness enters in through my ears, and that the universe is all inherently connected. I think that physicists place too much faith in the idea of randomness to explain every aspect of the universe and quantum equations. And I also believe that people can communicate with animals and even plants. So I can totally understand why you might think that all of these ideas are wrong, that they don't bear any reality to them other than what might be going on in my head. And to be honest, I'm pretty open to having my mind changed on pretty much any of these things because they're what I call lightly held beliefs, which is to say that they are ideas that help me make sense of the world, that order the reality that I live in. But I also know that if they change, they won't fundamentally alter the person that I am or necessarily even my worldview and how I interact with people and the material objects and the environment around me. In the present world, we are too caught up in firm beliefs, in calcified ideas, often to our detriment. Because the truth of the matter is that most of us, the scientists, the priests, the politicians and the demagogues, most of us are wrong, probably most of the time, when it comes to the objective reality that science might be able to offer. This podcast that I'm doing today has been on my mind for at least a year. It has been grinding at me because lightly held beliefs are really, really important. They can do things to change us, to become better people, better adapted to the world. In some cases, they can even heal us in a way that maybe even medical science doesn't really understand. But they also, at the same time that they have these benefits, they also have to be cast aside You need to be able to realize that they are lightly held because all of us and none of us really have any idea of the ultimate nature of reality. This is a podcast about that. Now, I've been reading this book by Carl Sagan, the late great astronomer and science communicator who, I mean, he should be one of the saints of the modern era, let's just say it. He is both a spiritual man and a hard-nosed scientist. The book is not one of his better known ones. It's called The Demon Haunted World, and I think it might be one of the last books that he wrote. Its subtitle is Science as a Candle in the Dark. And he begins the book with this warning that I think is really, really prescient about the era that we live in right now. Now, this was written uh, in 1996, but I think you'll recognize something of the modern world in what he was writing almost 20 years ago. Science is more than a body of knowledge. It is a way of thinking. I have a foreboding of an America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy, when nearly all the key manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few, and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority, when clutching to our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical facilities in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what is true, we slide almost without noticing back into superstition and darkness." That passage haunts me. He was writing at a time when America and the world was actually about to go into an economic boom. Things 
were getting good. And then, of course, there were some collapses also to follow. But he was aware. He predicted the point that we got to in, say, let's just say COVID, when the country bifurcated into two camps where both sides had some actually some good points, but neither side could listen. We could only talk about what we felt was right, and we didn't even notice it happening. Because science, for all of its shortcomings, is a way to look at objective reality, the things that are beyond our feelings, and say, this exists. It is verifiable. It is understandable by experts and, in many cases, even laymen. They are irrefutable in many cases. And yet, we also know that science, this big monolith out there, has its limitations. And our beliefs, while they can be very, very good, often go beyond the science, like all of the beliefs that I mentioned at the top of this podcast. They go oftentimes beyond what we can verify with um, hard-nosed instruments, good reasoning, and evidence. And beliefs are not bad, but they're limited. And my personal take on how we should approach our own beliefs is that we need to know when we are going beyond the science with our beliefs. Our beliefs should be subservient to the empirical reality that is out there. And while we can maintain any number of thoughts, including that sickness might come in through my ears, something which cannot be verified, but it's one reason why I wear a hat when I'm sick, those beliefs, that sort of silly belief, can exist until science says it is crazy or that it is, more importantly, harmful. If you've been listening to this podcast for a little while, you might remember my fifth episode, which is All Medicine is Mindful Medicine, in which I noted that beliefs alone are extremely powerful and that if you're going to take a drug, uh, you know, uh, from a doctor, a lot of its healing power in many cases comes from the placebo effect. And in fact, when you switch healing modalities, you gain to some degree a healing benefit that science can recognize, but has some trouble understanding what the mechanisms are behind it. Medical science, when we talk about pharmaceutical development, tries to show that a drug that you're taking, a medicine that you're taking, is above and beyond the healing power of the placebo effect. And this is a good thing. But it doesn't mean that that placebo effect, that power of belief, is bad. And this squishy area between empirical reality and that, that mystical juju <laughs> is really one of the things that, that I contend with every day. Because again, I have strange beliefs. I have ideas of how consciousness works. I have ideas how medicine works. And they don't always hold up to science, but sometimes I can empirically say that they do function correctly and in the way that I want them to. And because he is so much more eloquent than I am, I'm going to read another passage from Sagan. There is much that science doesn't understand many mysteries still to be resolved. In a universe, tens of billions of light years across and some 10 or 15 billion years old, this may be the case forever. We are constantly stumbling on surprises. Yet some New Age and religious writers assert that scientists believe that, quote, what they find is all there is. Scientists may reject mystic revelations for which there is no evidence, except somebody's say-so, but they hardly believe their knowledge of nature to be complete. Science is far from a perfect instrument of knowledge. It's just the best we have. In this respect, it's like democracy. 
Science by itself cannot advocate courses of human action, but it can certainly illuminate the possible consequences of alternative courses of action. That is just so beautifully said. Because what Sagan is putting forth here is that science is in itself a lightly held belief. The whole point of science and the scientific method is to assert something about the universe and then reject that when the evidence changes in front of you. He acknowledges that the tools that we have through collecting of evidence and, and the, the way that we, our instrumentation and even our human faculties in our brains can only conceive of a small sliver of what might be an ultimate reality. And yet, what we do see is real. And that reality cannot be ignored. Science, when it's practiced to the highest level, is flexible, and it rejects its own hypotheses of the universe when evidence changes. And this, I would like to posit to you, is also how we should accept our beliefs. If we know that science is truly limited in what it can offer, and we have ideas for how the universe works, we can go beyond the science. We can say, this is how I believe things work. And you can even operate under the assumption of whatever belief you want, except until you're able to show that your belief is wrong, in which case you should discard that lightly held belief and change tact. This is, of course, a real problem in the society that we live in today. I mean, most scientists, the actual guys in lab coats who are studying the neurons in our brains and the fundamental particles of physicists, are experts in tiny slivers of objective truth. I mean, they may know everything that there is to be known about one neuronal pathway, about how the optic nerve relays information to our brains. But that person may know nothing about climate science. Uh, they may have an approach to climate science that is different than someone else, but they're not true experts. And this is true for all of us. Most of us, I am not a scientist. You may or may not be a scientist, but many people who are listening to this podcast are not actually scientists. We all, to some extent, operate on our beliefs of what the world is and how the universe operates. And it's totally okay as long as we're flexible in those beliefs. But as we all know, as we have all seen, humans have a tendency to calcify beliefs. And there becomes almost camps. We will look at science and say, if it does not support our own image of the universe, we will posit that the science, the underlying evidence is wrong. And of course, and we maybe we'll go into this in another podcast, uh, everyone can cite a study these days, right? The moniker of science is peer-reviewed journal articles, and it just does seem that there's peer-reviewed journal, journal articles for just about any position out there. And that's a problem that, frankly, I do want to tackle, but I'm not going to tackle it today. But just sort of footnote that, that there's also a problem in science well, science communication. But people who are in this pro-science camp will hold up this idea of a scientific consensus in a way that is honestly, fundamentally unscientific. They argue that the authority of that person in the lab coat makes them essentially a priest of truth. They say, look, I have a PhD and I know more than you even if their specialty is in something entirely different. On the other side, we've all seen this as well, people embrace fringe ideas that can pull so far from what any sort of evidence can be mustered 
that it's really only their emotions telling you what their concept of what objective reality is. This is the bro science paradigm. Someone says some scientific sounding words and it almost becomes like a Latin liturgy. Well, I said that dopamine transmitters uh, in our mitochondria change the way that we reuptake oxygen or whatever. That's all gobbledygook, of course. But these sorts of languages convey a sense of authority, even if the underlying research is maybe, you know, still up to debate. At the end of the day, this calcification means that no one is willing to be proven wrong. No one is willing to admit that, they, that their position, which is fundamentally unscientific on both sides of this conversation, they don't admit that they're wrong. Scientists become unscientific when they're not willing to question the possibility that their hypothesis or even their theories or even their laws of nature could possibly be refuted by evidence. Of course, they're up against a group of people who just throw mountains of supposed evidence in a way to sap away their energy and just keep on positing arguments based on nothing. It's a problem. And this is why I think that all of us need to look inside ourselves and say that more often than not, the way we think the world works is not the way the world works. And we need to look at ourselves and say, hey, I can be wrong about my beliefs. In fact, my beliefs are probably wrong in some sort of ultimate sense, even if I may have gotten a few aspects correct. If we are not able to even be open to the idea of changing our minds, then who are we as people? Are we just people who argue on Twitter? Are we succumbing to some sort of internal passive fascist tendency that honestly all of us have inside of us? Because we all want to be right. We all want to be universally loved and we hate admitting that we're wrong. And the crazy thing about that sort of standpoint that many of us share is that we double down on our mistakes. We become wronger and wronger because it's the other side that we're fighting against instead of some sense of objective reality. Now, I want to sort of point at the insanity of two different groups here for just a moment, the science people and the non-science people. I'm going to use two examples that we're reasonably familiar with. The first one is my recent favorite. Uh, it's called the Yoni Egg, and I find this a wonderful totem of the calcification of two different camps of people who honestly have gone far beyond their purview. Now, for those of you who have never heard of the Yoni Egg, it is a jade or some sort of like hard egg-shaped rock that Gwyneth Paltrow has endorsed and sells for, I think they're like $80, and women put them into their vagina to help their pelvic floor. And it is a, the, the advertising on uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's website, Goop, uh, is, I mean, it's a little silly, right? It says that this is an ancient Chinese practice. It says that these things have been around for a long, long time, and that and by saying that, they're saying that if something is old, it must be right. And the thing is, her claims are just factually inaccurate. And there's a, a scientific paper that came up recently uh, that says very clearly that there is no archaeological evidence to say that the yoni egg is something that's been around for a long time. That it says it's ridiculous essentially. It says it's cultural appropriation, and we can go into that idea in another episode as well. However, when we talk to professional skeptics, and there's quite a few, and I'm not going to name them by names right now, because it's really a large group, and I'm not, I don't want to point at individuals, but the critique of Gwyneth Paltrow's Yoni Egg has come to stand in for a larger conversation about the problem of bro science, or in this case, mystical weird goop science. The yoni egg, they state, 
is what is the problem with people who go beyond uh, their purview? They say it is ridiculous to put an egg in your vagina because the egg is, you know, what is it? They, they sort of like make this joke, like you're not a bird, that you don't have a cloaca. Uh, they say that putting a yoni egg in you is dangerous because if you have a real medical condition, you're not treating it correctly. And in fact, maybe you'll get a bacterial infection and they go on and on and on and they point at Gwyneth Paltrow's admittedly ridiculous sometimes faith healing website. And they point to this yoni egg and say, this is an example of how bad it really is. Okay. Well, here's the problem with that sort of scientific demagoguery. Now, obviously I have never used a yoni egg, but I have done an extensive search of the scientific literature. I have questioned the skeptics directly and I can find zero clinical examples of a yoni egg actually landing a woman in a hospital. I have found no examples of a woman getting sepsis from a yoni egg. And I would like to note that women put lots of different things in their vaginas, often and usually without harm. And what is happening is that these scientists are pointing at something that they believe looks ridiculous and saying that that ridiculousness is the problem and somehow is dangerous. But I know some people who do use the yoni egg and say it helps them. It helps them with their pelvic floor and vaginal pain and other things like that. And they use it and whether or not that is a placebo effect, and it probably is a placebo effect, they get better from whatever that condition is that they're using. And certainly I know of no examples of someone getting harmed. So what's the problem with a lightly held belief to say the yoni egg is okay? There is nothing. It's totally fine to think that this product is okay. What's not okay is to say that the science behind it is sturdy, right? The problem is to say that this thing is right and that scientist is wrong. It's more to say, look, this works for me right now. And the scientists need to get off their high horse a little bit. And they need to acknowledge that as long as no one is getting hurt, this should be fine because a doctor and medicine is not science. Medicine is a practice to heal people. It is looking for a result which often has subjective understandings. Again, see my episode five, all medicine is mindful medicine. And then let me use the other, the contravening example. The world went crazy when COVID happened. Can we just acknowledge that we were all a little bit insane? There were two camps. One side was the, the pro-public health camp, and the other camp was the, let's just call them the pro-freedom camp, or the pro-independent thought camp, if you will. Some people demanded masks and vaccines because the public health authorities said that it was important and they had the science behind them. And the other side said, look, you should not trample on my freedoms and you don't know about masks anyway. Things are going to be okay if we just let the disease run its course. And interestingly enough, both sides cited clinical literature. Both sides had their different arguments about what was the right course. And, you know, I think in many cases their evidence was reasonable. And in some cases the evidence was totally unreasonable. Personally, I fall in that pro-science camp, maybe even a little too far into that pro-science camp. My belief continues to be that if we act as a society in unison, actually regardless of the effectiveness of the intervention, if we act in unison, we have a better chance of tackling a problem than we do as if we're all scattered and moving in different directions all at once. I believe that order is better than chaos. But now that history unfolded in the way that it did, 
I think we do have an ability to look backwards and realize that in those moments, in those initial moments, we didn't really know what the science was and or how things would pan out. We just made the best predictions we could based on the evidence that we had. And, you know, if you look at the way China responded, where the state really did crack down super heavily and enforce all of the public mandates that they could, I mean, it just seemed that they kicked the ball down the road and they had enormous waves of COVID right afterwards. So that didn't end up being, objectively speaking, the right way to do things. On the other hand, in America, where we had sort of chaos and and half attended to uh, uh, mask mandates and vaccination, and people on all different sides arguing and getting in very, very angry Twitter fights, well, that also didn't work out so great either. We have a very bifurcated society. We had a lot of people die. And I'm not even going to weigh in on whether more people have died in one way or another. What we can say is what we can objectively observe is things did not turn out right. And I think largely it's because we were all calcified in our beliefs. We were not able to say, look, maybe we can shift course if things aren't working correctly because everyone had their little trench and we shot tweets to one another hoping to change each other's minds. And nothing ultimately worked for the benefit of all people. So where does this leave us? What is the ultimate takeaway that I want us all to have from this idea of lightly held beliefs? Should we go with the science camp? Should we go with our beliefs camp? Well, it's both. I want us all to recognize that we are inherently fallible as humans. And we will go down certain directions, sometimes for years, and it will serve us because we will get by and we will continue to live our lives. But at some point, it's okay to say that something that you held on to strongly might have been built on false pretenses. Or that could be corrected with new and updated evidence. It is totally okay to be a little strange, to think that, well, perhaps sickness comes in through the ears. Perhaps this particular breathwork routine will help some underlying medical condition that I have right now. And if it does, hey, that's great. But if it doesn't, well, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I should try something else. We always have the opportunity It's the beauty of being alive. We have the opportunity to change the way that we see and interact with the world. And it's best to do that with some type of evidence and, importantly, humility. I have occasionally fallen down on this. I have occasionally gotten very angry at people because they're firmly held beliefs did not coincide with what my firmly held beliefs said. Rather than looking at evidence in a rational way and not just throwing studies at one another that we may or may not misread, I got angry or I got into a fight or on Twitter I said something really dumb and that I regret later. I think the real anger ultimately comes from two people or two communities calcifying in general and not allowing some level of flexibility. Because if someone else has a very rigid understanding of the world, it makes me more rigid in my understanding of the world. And two hard objects, well, when they strike each other, they break to pieces, they get brittle. If we're more flexible, and if everyone is more flexible, well, the world will be a better place. And I assume, and I hope, and it is my lightly held belief, that the world will move on a better path in the future. That all people will be able to approach some collective notion of truth together if we're able to reject 
our own beliefs and our own hypotheses occasionally based on reasoned debate and good evidence. Of course, this will also open up a big question on expertise, which we should look at, right? We should say that, um, you know, there's, there's something about ex experts that we hate right now because we hate someone who says that they are an authority and they say that they are right in all things because, hey, I have a PhD, right? We hate that person just shoving their knowledge down our throat. And yet at the same time, we should probably respect their knowledge when their knowledge is offered with humility. It is a tricky business, for sure. But as Sagan notes, a good scientist is a scientist that's willing to look at evidence and reject their hypothesis if it's wrong. We want good scientists in the world and we want a good public. There's no way that any one of us is going to change the views of other people by getting angry at them. We're only going to be able to do it with humility and honesty and by occasionally rejecting the things that we hold dear. I want to thank you for being here. Um, you know, many of you have been here since the very beginning, since I started talking about the Enlightenment trap. I grabbed my microphone and have started talking into the ether. And I think that, I mean, you know, maybe you can go through some of my stuff and tell me, you were sort of crazy in this episode, and I will, I hope, embrace that as a lightly held um, belief. I think you should check out, um, if you haven't listened to it already, uh, All Medicine is Mindful Medicine, because I really talk about how the, the strangeness of belief has outcomes on human health in ways that are in some ways beyond science, but also empirically verifiable. It's pretty bizarre stuff, and I'll I will, it will likely be a theme in much of what I do going forward as well. This podcast, it doesn't survive without you listening. And the only reason I do it, I mean, you maybe you've noticed that I don't have any advertisements in it. I don't really intend to ever put advertisements in this. I want this to be an ad-free channel. And hopefully that makes your listening experience better. And to help support me, since I don't get those three cents for every listen, I'd love you to tell a friend. I'd love you to go out there and say, hey, look, this is actually sort of some useful stuff he said here. Or maybe you're going to go in the other way. Maybe you're going to say, this guy's crazy. Listen to his crazy ideas. Let's start a conversation about it, you and I. To your friend. It doesn't, I don't need to see tweets. You don't need to tweet it or Instagram it or blue sky it or whatever. Tell a human about how these ideas might be useful to you or to them. And maybe you're in an argument with somebody and want to show that you could be humble in something that maybe you've said that you've gone a little bit too far in. Maybe you believe sickness comes in through your ears like I do and someone disagreed with you. Whatever it is, what I want most out of this show is to help the public dialogue on complex issues. I feel like that's a worthy offering to give the world. And thankfully, I'm doing this without ads here so that you can just listen to it and not worry about all that commercial bullshit, which is taken over the internet. Without all of that self-aggrandizing monetization that all the platforms want us to engage in. I just want to give you my thoughts and I really hope this is useful to you. From Pokey Bear LLC in Denver, Colorado, this is Scott Carney Investigates signing off. Mm -hmm.